JRPGs are usually long experiences full of amazing story and great gameplay, but we all know there are times where you might be looking for a nice and quick experience. I've been playing JRPGs for countless years, and I've played some pretty amazing ones. Some are incredibly long, like Persona 5, and some can be pretty short, like Final Fantasy IV. Usually, when you think about JRPGs, you think of these grand 60-hour experiences, but sometimes you want something short, be it the need for a palate cleanser, or maybe you're just looking to kill some time before a new game release you're highly anticipating. These short JRPGs can be just as amazing as the long ones, and today we're here to talk about 10 JRPGs that are a bit on the shorter side. For this video, I'm considering a short JRPG as a JRPG within 25 hours, and as a side rule, there will not be any indie JRPGs mentioned in this video because generally, they're usually on the shorter side. With that being said, let me know in the comments below what your favorite short JRPGs are, and grab a drink, grab a snack, strap yourselves in while we talk about 10 JRPGs that you can play if you're looking for a quick, solid experience. Ys, the Oath in Felgana, originally released in 2005 for the BC, and later released on PSP, Switch, PlayStation 4, and PlayStation 5. The Oath in Felgana is a remake of the third title in the Ys franchise. This is a game that I've mentioned several times on this channel, but that's only because it's such a fantastic game that I feel any action JRPG fan should play. This game is also quite short, so if you need a nice quick experience, the Oath in Felgana is perfect. You can play through it, seeing everything within about 10 to 12 hours. This is by far my favorite East title, and honestly, I can't get enough of it. The gameplay is simplistic, almost feeling like a Metroidvania with each of the new abilities you earn. It has incredibly difficult bosses, which can sound intimidating, but it's thanks to the difficulty of these bosses that you get that amazing feeling of accomplishment. The most important aspect of this game though, when it comes to how amazing it is, has to be the soundtrack. Falcom games generally have fantastic music, but Oath and Felgana takes it to a whole new level. If you're interested in hearing the soundtrack, but you only have a little bit of time, check out Valestine Castle. Or The Boys Got Wings from the soundtrack. These are some of my favorite Falcom tunes to ever exist. Honestly, just play the Yoth and Pelgana. It's the perfect bridge to break up some long experiences, especially if you need a break from turn-based JRPGs. Chrono Trigger. Initially released in 1995 for the Super Nintendo, but also released through the years for PlayStation, Nintendo DS, iOS, Android, and Windows. Supposedly also for something called iMode in Japan. Honestly, I had never heard of that, but a simple Google search says it's a mobile internet service in Japan. Hmm, the more you know, I guess. Anyways, Chrono Trigger, clocking in at about 20 hours to play through, really needs no introduction. Chrono Trigger is often slated as one of, if not the greatest and most influential JRPG to ever exist. This is with good reason, however. Chrono Trigger was so far ahead of its time with its release, and while some may say that's due to nostalgia, even people first experiencing Chrono Trigger in the 2020s can understand why it's as fantastic as it is. Now, as I said, Chrono Trigger is about 20 hours for a playthrough, and while that is true, you can play it from beginning to end in that time, Chrono Trigger is a game that is designed for multiple playthroughs. In fact, there are 12 different endings, 13 on the DS and Windows version, and the first ending actually has five different versions of it. So by using the New Game Plus feature and carrying over your previous gameplay stats, which I think Chrono Trigger was the first game to actually feature a New Game Plus mode, you can blast through the other 12 endings. I feel Chrono Trigger is a game that's mandatory to play even if you're only slightly a JRPG fan. It's for sure one of my favorites. Trials of Mana. Originally released in 1996 for the Super Famicom as Saiken Densetsu 3, 
received a remake in 2020 for the Switch, PlayStation 4, Xbox Series consoles, PC, and mobile apparently. Well, that's new information to me. I had no idea. Anyways, the Trials of Mana remake is about 20 hours long if you want to just see the main story. However, this is again a case of being a game that is meant to have multiple playthroughs. The story of Trials of Mana is told through three different stories, featuring a total of six different characters. So naturally, you could probably spend about 50 to 60 hours total playing through the game, depending if you want to watch the same scenes over and over again with different characters. The remake of Trials of Mana was my first experience with the game, and I adored it. It's bright, it's beautiful, and the soundtrack is absolutely fantastic. It is a relatively simple action RPG as far as mechanics and gameplay goes, but it's just so whimsical and fun. The fact that you have six characters, and not only are they all vastly different from one another, they also have several different classes that offer unique experiences. So realistically, you can play this game an insane amount of times, all offering a different experience with the game. The only downside with Trials of Mana is Charlotte. She has one of the most annoying uwu voices I have ever experienced. Seriously, it's meme-worthy. Not even slightly exaggerating. It's not even bad voice acting, it's just... annoying. Lufia 2 Rise of the Sinistrals Released in 1995 for the Super Nintendo. And only the Super Nintendo. That is totally not fair. Anyways, clocking in at 25 hours, this is just barely able to make it onto this list. Lufia 2 is a freaking fantastic game. I played it for the first time this year, and it shot up as one of my favorite JRPGs of all time. I actually reviewed this game, so if you're curious of what a first timer thought about the game in 2024, check that out after you're done here. Lufia 2 is a turn based JRPG with an amazing score, amazing characters, fantastic puzzles, and some of the most heart wrenching scenes I've ever experienced in a JRPG. Anyways, so I said this game is 25 hours. Keep in mind, that's only if you beeline the story, and don't struggle too much with some of the puzzles. Let's not even start with the Ancient Cavern, this roguelike portion of the game can easily add an additional 30 to 50 hours of gameplay depending on how addicted to this minigame you get. I use the term minigame loosely, considering how this side quest is hardly mini in the first place. When talking about Lufia 2, I can't not talk about the single greatest piece of battle music to ever exist. Fans of the game know exactly what I'm talking about. The Sinistral battle theme is possibly the most hype and awe-inspiring battle themes I have ever experienced. It's super intense, fear-inducing, it is absolutely perfect. I don't say that lightly. Name a better battle theme, I dare you. Like I said, Lufia 2 is amazing. It's not just because of this battle theme. Everything about the game is ideal when it comes to a JRPG. Live Alive, or is it Live Alive? I have no idea. Initially released only in Japan on the Super Famicom in 1994, received a remake worldwide in 2022 for the Switch, PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, and PC. Live Alive is such a unique JRPG. Or, if you want to be more specific, it's like a bunch of unique, smaller JRPGs. Live Alive is separated into seven different chapters, each featuring a different character in a different time period and setting. These can range from the prehistoric era, to the Wild West, or even to the distant future. After completing all of these seven chapters, you tie all the stories together with a final chapter for a true final boss. Some of these stories are as long as 5 hours long, but others can be done within like 30 minutes. So not only is it a relatively short game as a whole, each individual story is almost designed to be played in a single setting. My first experience with this game was the remake, and it's safe to say that I wasn't able to put it down. I never got a chance to play the original, considering it was a Japan exclusive. Though a fan translation was released, the original just wasn't on my to playlist. I know now that I should have given it a shot because this was one of my favorite games of 2022 and it's another that I highly suggest. Especially considering that it isn't a huge commitment with how short the game is. Definitely worth a playthrough, especially if you're into retro style JRPGs. 
Mega Man Battle Network, released in 2001 for the Game Boy Advance, and later on received a remaster collection in 2023 for the Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4, and PC. While I am talking about the first game in the series here, which is only about 13 hours long, realistically you could probably put almost any game from the series on this list. The Mega Man Battle Network games are all very short experiences, but that doesn't make them bad. They're actually quite fun, using a form of card-based battle systems where you equip a deck of 30 chips to do battle, which determine which attacks you are able to use. Battles take place on a 6x3 grid divided in half, one half for you, and one half for your enemies. As you fight, you build up a custom gauge, and when it's full, you press a shoulder button, and then you are dealt 6 chips from your deck, and you can use them to do various attacks. I remember first playing this game on an emulator in high school, and the games are still some of my favorite entries in the Mega Man franchise. This is probably because I'm more drawn to JRPGs over platformers, but that's not to say I don't like platformers, I'm a huge Castlevania fan, but the RPG style just really spoke to me for obvious reasons. My only real complaint about the first Mega Man Battle Network game is the dungeons. They can be some of the most difficult to navigate dungeons when you combine the incredibly high encounter rate with rooms that look exactly the same around every corner. I'd highly suggest picking up the collection. It's commonly on sale and worth every penny. Earthbound, released for the Super Nintendo in 1994. Lasting about 20 to 25 hours, depending on encounter rate and how familiar you are with some of the silly puzzles, Earthbound is definitely a game you can play in a few days time. The first time I played it, I'll be honest, I didn't care for it. I thought it was just a bad game. It was incredibly ridiculous, and the humor just didn't do it for me. Seriously, some of the humor was just, why? Using a pencil eraser to erase an actual pencil barrier, or fighting piles of vomit, taxis, and walking nooses? It's honestly such a weird game, but because it's so weird, it's also such a unique experience. Eventually, I came around and realized just how genius some of the themes of this game actually are. I won't go into details about them because Earthbound is best experienced blind, but it's definitely up there as one of the most memorable experiences I have ever had as far as video games go. This is actually part of the Mother trilogy, it's the second game, and as sad as it is to admit, I haven't played Earthbound Beginnings, or Mother 3 at this point. Well, I played some of Earthbound Beginnings and Mother 3, but I haven't finished either of them. Earthbound Beginnings I just got frustrated with, considering how retro it actually is, and Mother 3, I have no reason why I stopped playing that, I'm sorry. I wasn't bored, I was enjoying it, I just didn't finish it. If you haven't played Earthbound before, please don't look at getting a Super Nintendo copy of it. It's incredibly overpriced, seriously, you're looking at anywhere from $200 for the cart only up to as high as $2,700 for it complete. The retro market is insane, and this is one of the more pricey games. Just go spend the $30 on a year of Nintendo Online and play it on your Switch. Or find a different way to play it, we all know what I'm talking about. But anyways, play Earthbound, you will not regret it. Golden Sun, released in 2001 for the Game Boy Advance. To play the main story, it should take you about 22 hours to complete. Golden Sun is one of those games that I freaking love to death. It has a unique take on the job system, some beautiful art for the Game Boy Advance, and one of Matoi Sakuraba's greatest battle themes he has ever composed. And it even kind of has a monster collection aspect. I love everything about the game, but I haven't finished it yet. I'm sorry. Don't ask me why, but for some reason, I have these games that I adore, and really enjoy, but never actually end up finishing them. Golden Sun is actually part one of a two game series. The sequel is a bit longer, at 31 hours according to how long to beat, but if the first game is of any indication, it's probably just as great and we won't even talk about the third game. Golden Sun is great, but it does one thing that bothers me. This one thing is the fact that auto retargeting doesn't exist. So what auto retargeting is, is if you attack an enemy and a previous party member killed that enemy, normally in most JRPGs, you'll just target the next enemy instead of trying to attack that space that the dead enemy was in. I'll never understand this mechanic. It made sense back on say the Nintendo and Sega Master System with the limited processing power and memory, but it has no place on a Game Boy Advance JRPG. It's just so weird. 
Other than that though, I'd say it's one of the great JRPGs that any fan of the genre should play. Though I hear the game ends on a cliffhanger to tie it to the sequel, but hey, it worked for Trails in the Sky, so I'm sure it'll be fine here. Go play Golden Sun. It's on Nintendo Switch Online, along with its sequels, so there really isn't any excuse not to. And yes, I'm aware of this, that I haven't played it yet, I should really listen to my own advice honestly. The Legend of Nayuta Boundless Trails, released originally on the PSP, exclusively in Japan, in 2012, but got a remaster worldwide in 2023 for the PlayStation 4, Switch, and PC. So before we start, no, this is not a Trails game. Boundless Trails has no relation to games like Trails in the Sky and Trails of Cold Steel, despite it being done by Falcom and having the word Trails in it. It's actually a side spin-off action RPG somewhat familiar to East. I was honestly surprised by this game, and it's actually a lot of fun. The best way I can describe it is Boundless Trails is like East if it was stage-based. Clocking in at about 18 hours, the game isn't incredibly fantastic or amazing, but honestly, it was a nice short experience that respects your time. You won't be blown away by the gameplay, nor will you come out of it thinking that you just played a game that changed your life but it is absolutely a game that you will remember. Honestly, it kind of reminds me of collect-a-thon games from the PS1 era, since each stage has a select number of missions that need to be completed in order to 100% that stage. Honestly, I just had a lot of fun with Nayuta, and even if it isn't connected to the Kiseki franchise, it has a solid self-contained story featuring plenty of twists that will keep you interested. Seriously, you should give it a shot if you're looking for something short to keep you entertained for a few days. Just keep in mind, it was originally a PSP game, so make sure you keep your expectations in check. Threads of Fate, also known as Duprism, released for the original PlayStation in 2000. Threads of Fate is an incredibly short action RPG, clocking in at about 13 hours for the main story, and if you really want to do everything, you could probably boost that up to about 22 hours. Honestly, it's a super short game, but is designed to be played twice with two main characters. You can either play as Rue, who can transform into monsters, or you can play as a spellcaster named Mint. I want to go ahead and say this is one of the first PlayStation games I remember playing, which is probably why it sticks in my head so well. However, the first time I played it, the game would hang after beating a big dragon boss, making it impossible for me to finish the game. I definitely do not miss the days where games would struggle to load. Thankfully, that isn't as common these days. The PS1 days were an anxiety-inducing time, weren't they? Threads of Fate is as basic as they come. You run through various stages and dungeons, fighting enemies, getting stronger, and going through probably one of the most lighthearted stories to ever grace gaming. Now I say this, but some things were just weird. Mel is one thing that comes to mind, as well as stats going up by either getting attacked to gain HP or using abilities to raise MP. The second one isn't that strange, but not exactly that common for action RPGs. It works and it makes sense, but young me had no idea how it worked. I love Threads of Fate, and I feel it needs more love, either in the form of a re-release or remaster, but maybe one day? But until then? Let's just keep on dreaming for it, because Threads of Fate is a fantastic game that deserves to be played by more people. So there you have it, 10 JRPGs that are incredibly respectful of your time and are a joy to play. Not every JRPG has to be this extended, long, 250 hour journey for you to get your worth out of it. Short adventures can be just as enjoyable and fulfilling as the full length ones. Were there any short JRPGs I missed that you would suggest people play? Be sure to let me know in the comments below, and if you enjoy this video, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to my channel, and ding that notification bell so you don't miss any of my future content. But before you leave, make sure to check this video out next. I'm sure it's something that will really interest you, especially if you enjoyed this video. Anyways, this has been Shinky. Thanks so much for watching, and as always, have a wonderful day.